Welcome to the Business Radio Network. Enjoy Small Biz, Big Voices with Stephanie Rising. Hi, I'm Stephanie Rising, a business coach and author in beautiful Tucson, Arizona. Being a small business owner is rewarding, but can feel lonely. Few people understand what it's like to sweat payroll, market themselves as a brand, or create revenue streams from scratch. For the next hour, join your tribe on Small Biz Big Voices, the podcast that celebrates the stories and impact of your fellow small business owners. Today, we're going to visit with Jamie Vink, the CEO of Sierra Tucson. Our interview will conclude with a Proust lightning round, and our final segment will be Dear Coach, when I'll coach listeners through issues they've emailed in. First, it's my pleasure to introduce Sierra Tucson CEO, Jamie Vink. Since 1983, Sierra Tucson has strived to be a renowned leader in clinical excellence and compassionate care. Their goal is to help break the stigma that surrounds addiction and mental illness, as well as promote the importance of mental wellness. Recommended by doctors and therapists across the world, their renowned programs have resulted in positive changes for over 34,000 individuals and more than 90,000 family members. As only the second woman in Sierra Tucson's 36-year history to hold the facility's top leadership position, Jamie Vink was named Chief Executive Officer in December of 2017. She is recognized as a mentor to women in leadership positions both at Sierra Tucson and within the industry. Jamie was named Licensed Professional Champion at the 2018 Women of Influence Awards sponsored by Inside Tucson Business. Jamie is consistently acknowledged as one of the top leaders in Arizona in both healthcare and behavioral health. In 2018, Jamie was elected to the Board of Directors of the National Association of Addiction Treatment Providers. Her recent interviews can be found on National Public Radio, U.S. News & World Report, Cosmopolitan Magazine, and Human Resources Executive Magazine. Jamie, welcome to the show, and congratulations, I heard this morning, that you were just named one of Arizona's top women business leaders by Arizona Business Magazine. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for your time. I know how busy you are, and the information you have to share with us today is so valuable, so thank you in advance. Um, before entering the behavioral health field, you had a successful career in human resource management with the Chrysler Corporation. Corporation and OmniPoint Communications, which is T-Mobile. Um, coming from that background, what did you learn from those experiences that have helped to shape the leadership style that you use today? Well, that's a great question. And I would say, as I ponder that, the most important item that I learned from my days in a bargaining unit environment at Chrysler in labor relations would be collaboration, hmm. give and take, consensus building, and how to take people with um, seemingly oppositional views on a situation and bring them together for a shared goal. And really, and so both people leave the table feeling as though they won. Hmm. It, not like that has any application to today's environment whatsoever. None whatsoever. <laughs> and I, I always, I'm interested in picking the, the brains of people who have corporate experience because very often um, two things are true. One, uh, they kind of reach a point where they get their fill of it and they're looking for a, a smaller, more personal environment. But on the other hand, they've they've learned so much from that experience. And I think that small business owners sometimes have this attitude that there isn't anything to learn from a corporate environment because they're so intent on keeping that small familial atmosphere. And, you know, I don't want to be corporate mm -hmm. is something that I hear a lot from people. Um, I, I escaped, uh, a corporate job myself, but I learned so much from that. I don't think I would be able to do what I do today to the level that I'm able to do it had I not had that education. Um, so, you know, kind of speaking to the the small business community, what would you kind of caution them against in terms of their limiting who they learn from and, and how. Mm -hmm. Well, 
my path took an interesting turn because I left corporate America, so to speak, and was a small business owner. I had a very successful private practice as an independently licensed clinician in Scottsdale. And what I found is that the discipline that I learned from a corporation Mm -hmm. really was helpful in terms of being able to um, do my own paperwork and to to really have regard for my collectibles and those kinds of things, because oftentimes at least clinicians aren't savvy in those areas. Mm -hmm. And so what I found is that if I could build upon the skill set that I had honed while in a corporation, apply it to my private practice, and then I came back to the corporate world, Hmm. which is kind of an interesting segue. Because Sierra Tucson is owned by a larger parent company, correct? We're owned by Acadia Healthcare, which is the largest behavioral health company in the world. And I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I only found that out preparing for this interview. I always thought that Sierra Tucson was uh, like a standalone Mm -hmm. company. So I I didn't know that they had someone behind them um, bringing resources and structure. And uh, what is it like reconciling that local presence with a larger structure? Well, we have a great deal of autonomy Mm -hmm. and something that Acadia does, it allows each one of us facilities and they have five over 500 facilities, but we're all able to have our own identity Mm -hmm. and remain autonomous. They have great respect that we understand our patients and we understand our market. Mm -hmm. And so I believe it's the best of both worlds. It has been the best of both worlds for me because I am able to to practice with an entrepreneurial flair and Mm -hmm. to start new programs. We've started some great new programs this year and also to have the support and the structure of a parent company that resources us in important areas such as expanding to provide more access to care and also patient safety and educating our staff so we can all grow and be the best that we can be in serving our patients. Has Sierra Tucson opened a a, a large facility on campus this year, correct? We did, 44 additional beds. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's good. And you do such wonderful work. I mean, the more people who can benefit from what Sierra Tucson has to offer, the the better. So uh, circling back around to making that jump from mm-hmm. labor relations to being a healthcare professional, um, you know, I think the whole career path paradigm has shifted radically um, over the years. I think earlier generations were accustomed to going to work at one place, getting a pension, retiring at a certain age, and really their career was was dominated by one company. Now, people are not only moving from company to company, but they may be having success like yourself in more than one field. Mm-hmm. I think even though that's more common practice now, there's still that that fear of going from, you know, maybe the devil, you know, and jumping into the unknown, even though the unknown is what excites you and and drives your energy. Did you have any like fear or reservations about going from your corporate background where you had tremendous resources and structure at your disposal to going into private practice and in a completely different field. I certainly did. And I'm smiling at you as we're sitting here talking <laughs> about this because I'm, I go back to a decision that I made. I wanted more education. So I wanted to um, go to graduate school. And I was considering, considering either an accounting degree and being a CPA or mm-hmm. going to get my master's in professional counseling. And one was the easy way, what I knew I was good at, because I became a compensation expert in human resources. Mm -hmm. And the other was I knew that I was inspired to do this. I wanted to do more. I wanted to help more people. And I wanted to understand the emotional mind and Mm -hmm. why people did what they did. Mm -hmm. Especially, I mean, labor relations to me, I do see that serving as some kind of 
a jumping off point into mental health. Exactly. And even with employee relations and compensation at Chrysler, I was extremely fortunate that I was able to rotate my position every year and Mm -hmm. to be exposed to the entire um, human resource labor relations field. And they would always tease me. They'd call me Mother Teresa of compensation (laughs) because I would always, well, tell me more about that. Let me help with that. And so it was one follow my heart and the other one follow my head. And I I've followed my heart and I'm extremely blessed. Oh, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. What, what, um, do you remember one thing that stood out in your mind in particular where you, you really had to like take a deep breath and sort of gulp and just do it? Yes. It's my ego starting over. Because when I, you know, I had done pretty well for myself in human resources and I was a director level making, you know, really good money. And um, I had to step back. And my first job out of graduate school, I did night groups in downtown Phoenix with people getting out of prison on drug charges. And I was the new kid sitting in on a, the group that nobody else wanted to do. That's very humbling. No, yes, yes. It was extremely humbling and it was scary. No kidding. Yeah. And so I was able to really swallow hard and dig deep and search for my source of inspiration. And, you know, it was a woman, a mentor of mine Hmm. that taught me how to build upon the skills that I had and to remind myself that I what I knew. I think that's a really good point You know, for those who are are thinking about dipping their toe Mm -hmm. in another career path. If, if you can align yourself with a really good mentor, I think it cuts that fear factor in half because all of a sudden things that you're not sure whether they're possible or you kind of think they are, but this is all highly theoretical. Suddenly you're having really meaningful conversations with someone who's kind of been there, done that, and they can shine the light for you. And it makes a, a huge difference. I was very fortunate um, in finding a mentor early on that helped me make my transition from a completely unrelated field. But the experience that I got in that job, um, I, I, the strategy of it and the communications, the interactions with people, I knew that there was something that I wanted to do with my skill. Uh, I just didn't want to be in that particular industry anymore. So my mm-hmm. mentor made a huge difference for me. They absolutely can. And, you know, I learned vulnerability as well as humility. Yes. And I was extremely vulnerable with my mentor and she could really um, guide me along the way. And that is hard. Yes. The vulnerability mm-hmm. part of it. You're used to being competent. You're used to knowing your stuff. You've ex- You've reached a certain level of excellence in your previous career. And now all of a sudden you're starting from scratch and you have to say things like, I don't know what I'm doing when you used to be the person who had all the answers. Yes. It's, it's uh, unnerving. It certainly is. And I find that I keep doing it. I keep going. (laughs) I keep going into different areas and with the confidence that I can learn. And when I'm inspired to do something, I just do it. That's awesome. Um, Well, I mean, speaking of just jumping in and now it's your turn to kind of mentor and lead the way for other people. Last month, uh, the treatment center executives held a national retreat in New Orleans and you were invited to speak about breaking down organizational silos. I think anyone who's ever worked for a reasonably sized company knows what it feels like to have one department pit itself against another. Mm -hmm. Uh, What advice can you offer to business owners who are really trying to shift their company culture from that kind of tribalism to the cooperation and collaboration that you mentioned earlier? It all begins at the top. And for those of us that have been fortunate enough to have a leadership position to be able to clearly articulate what the mission is. Because I believe all of us in the workplace want to feel as though every morning when we are on our way into work that we're working for a common goal. Yes. And clearly ours at Sierra Tucson is mental health. 
and to help people um, be restored to their lives before their depression, addiction, those kinds of things took over. So ours might be a little bit easier, but in, on the business side of things, if we have a shared vision and that the leader is able to verbalize, okay, here's your part. And here's the other part. Not one is more important than the other. We are all equals in the mission. Mm -hmm. And then when the mission is manifested into reality, that becomes accountability. And so we can hold one another accountable in a supportive way to get to that mission. And so I'm very, um, I don't use words like staff or department everything that I say is much more collaborate and teams. Mm -hmm. So I find that even language helps in terms of breaking down silos, because when I hear the word department, I think of a silo Yeah, where mine ends and yours begins rather than, no, we're all on, in this together, working to move the ball in, in the common way. So do you feel that... Uh, in order to achieve this, the mission, there has to be something about the mission that is maybe more um, philosophical. I mean, not not to like um, for this to sound dismissive in any way, but like Chrysler makes cars. T-Mobile is about yeah. phones and whatnot. So if, if you're working for a company where you are actually producing a widget, like you said, Sierra Tucson, it's very it's very easy to rally around. A, a cause um, and something that has kind of an intrinsic feeling to it that people are going to gravitate toward. But if you are working for a company where you're producing a widget and you want people to collaborate and cooperate and rally together, do you think people need to create a, a mission that has some kind of philosophical aim or a less tangible aim. Yes. And I feel that it's all about attaching meaning. Hmm. And I believe I could attach meaning to anything. You know, I think about Chrysler and I know what Chrysler Corporation meant to the city of Detroit. Yes. And the people that were educating their children because they had worked there for 30 years on the assembly line. Yeah. And when the automotive companies didn't do well, it seriously impacted the city of Detroit. So that's a purpose. Mm -hmm. The viability of our hometown. The other thing is if you look at vehicles themselves, mm -hmm. people are very passionate about their vehicle and they the sure history. <laughs> and, you know, the what we can do in terms of the environment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you get my point. I yeah. think if we drill down, I can find meaning in everything. With wireless communication, when I started there, it was 96. And the fact that we had these boxes that were wireless that we could talk to yeah. and get text messages. Oh my gosh. But how many lives have been changed and saved because of those devices? Very good points. And mm -hmm. I think this is the challenge to business owners who yes. maybe who they've never done a, a real mission, vision, values exercise before because yes. they think it's too fluffy mm -hmm. and it doesn't really mean anything. But you know, in, instead of saying, well, my mission is to be the best possible XYZ company in Tucson, that, that doesn't necessarily ring people's chimes. But like you said, if if you're looking for the impact that you're making on your community, the impact that you have the ability uh, to make on for your employees and on their families' lives, it, it drives it a little closer to home and it makes it less theoretical and more, I think, is relatable. I agree. And, you know, we all want to be part of, as human beings, we all long to be part of something, to belong yes. to something. And so as we create our brands and enhance our brands, making it something to be a part of where people are proud. Yeah, I work there. That that That's another way to attach meaning to mm -hmm. it. And it, kind of along the lines of, of getting teams to think outside of their box. I found it really interesting that you had Sierra Tucson partner with DePaul University mm -hmm. School of Hospitality Leadership. When I read that in a recent interview with you, I thought that was such an inspired idea. Mm -hmm. I would never have thought of that. And then when I read it, I immediately connected 
the dots. And I just thought that was great. Mm -hmm. Um, Take us through your thought process behind that decision and what you were able to achieve by making that unusual move. So in 2015, we were struggling with the resident experience. And if you think about someone coming into treatment, there's a lot of shame. There's Mm -hmm. typically been a crisis. You know, they just didn't get up one morning and say, "Mm, I'm going to go to rehab today. A negative life event typically occurs that brings someone into treatment. So when they come in, there's shame, there's fear a number of things that are going on. And in our staff, some of our staff is direct patient care. So, you know, they're born to talk with people when they're in that state. Other folks, not so much. And so what we needed to do was really step back and focus on what's it like to be that person coming in. Mm -hmm. And where where could we look to find who was doing it well? Who was creating that beautiful experience when someone walked in the door? So we looked to the hospitality industry. And we have Merivelle right across the street from us. It's, and they provide, I believe, one of the best experiences that a guest could experience. You mm-hmm. From the moment you walk in the door, from the moment you buzz, hello, welcome. We've been waiting for you. We're glad you're here. And yeah, that we, makes such a difference. Exactly. And when you go, um, what, what we were trying to create was that feeling that, A, you're very welcome. We're glad you're here and that you want to be here. So we started to look mm. at the hospitality industry and schools of hospitality management. And I happened to have a connection at DePaul and through my husband is on one of their boards and he's an alumni of DePaul. And so he connected me. And as the universe gives you exactly what you need, Mm -hmm. one of their customer service professors, his mom had been to treatment and had recently passed away. And so he was inspired to come out and spend a couple weeks with us and look at our experience and to make recommendations of things that we could do to really restore the dignity back to the process and then also to train our staff on how do you how do you treat a patient and what do you do to make someone feel welcome what have you noticed has been the effect of of this training and and getting this different perspective from a completely uh, separate industry so what was really interesting is that what we implemented immediately was the mid treatment survey Because what he taught us is that the most frustrating thing is you give feedback after an experience has completed. Mm, Good point. And then they don't get to it. You don't get to a learn from their from their feedback in real time, nor do you get to show them that you care and that you are you're willing to change Mm. so many of our residents come completely demoralized depressed and they don't feel like anyone would listen to them so if if we are getting someone's feedback mid-treatment and they're telling us something for example um i wish that there was more um, fresh vegetables Hmm. on the lunch selection. And then the next day, if they see there's fresh vegetables, they feel better about their experience, but they also feel better about themselves. It's immediately validating. Because their voice matters. Exactly. And Hmm. so that was something that we learned from him as well. That is such a great idea. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm thinking of a whole list of clients that I want to talk to about doing a mid-year survey Mm -hmm. with them and just kind of checking in. I know as a consumer, um, I really appreciate it when someone asks, how was, how was your experience? Or, you know, if I'm dealing with them for any length of time, there is kind of that midpoint Mm -hmm. check in. And is there anything else that we can do for you? Do you have any questions? Anytime a company leaves me with the impression that even though I've given them money, they still care about my experience and what I think, I will be loyal to them forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm i so grateful for that level of professionalism. So that's a really great idea. Uh, we're going to take just a quick break. 
This is Small Biz Big Voices, hosted by Stephanie Rising. I'm a small business coach on a mission to get business owners off their hamster wheel and empower them as authentic and influential leaders. My coaching program centers around the seven primal business needs. Today, I'm visiting with Jamie Vink of Sierra Tucson. Now, for a variety of reasons, Sierra Tucson is a very high-profile organization. It's a world-renowned treatment center. It has famous clients. And the very nature of your work has life-altering consequences. I know a lot of business owners struggle in their relationship with various media, especially online reviews. And I imagine that is all the more tricky for a company like yours. When Sierra Tucson receives bad reviews or bad press, it, you know, what is your approach to dealing with it? And and also if you could elaborate on whether you think sometimes Sierra Tucson pays a public price for having to maintain individual confidentiality. Mhm. Well, it's interesting and I'll take the media first. Okay. We have received um a number of negative media attention mm-hmm. and media stories. And we simply cannot respond. Yeah. And our response is always at Sierra Tucson. We re- we are committed to clinical excellence and our patient care is our top priority, as is their confidentiality. Mm-hmm. And so we are limited in what we can say. Mm-hmm. And we do respond with that um with that statement whenever there is a negative story about us. Um, In terms of the reviews, it's the same sort of thing. We can't go on and, first of all, engage in any sort of dialogue with them. Right. And I've had family members ask me, why why do you take that? Why can't you give your side? Because, A, it wouldn't be good for the person that's making the complaint. Hmm. And typically, you know, they're someone that's still struggling. Yes. And why would we engage in any sort of verbal altercation with them? They need to heal. And so the best thing to do is to just let it rest. Hmm. And so, but do I believe Sierra Tucson is the target at times? Yes. Yeah. I know, you know, this seems to be an increasingly uh, stressful issue for business owners to deal with because if they respond to these reviews or these negative comments online they feel like they're they're going to go down some tit for tat rabbit hole and that has no bottom and they don't want to look bad because they you know they're getting embroiled in that and yet at the same time it, if they don't say anything at all, they they feel um, like exposed and defenseless. And particularly when something is just really not true mm-hmm. or, you know, huge chunks of fact are being left out of the person's account of things. And so it's it's difficult because even, as, you know, as a consumer, I look at online reviews. I'm, I'm looking at how my peers have had experiences with other companies. Now, I tend to take things with a grain of salt. And if there are a handful of bad reviews, but the overwhelming majority of people are having a positive experience, well, it's like, you know, everyone has a bad day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I tend not to take that too seriously. But um, it's hard not to take it personally and to feel protective of your company and want to fight back. And so I think people wind up with this very frustrated energy and they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of festers. That's exactly right. And what we've done is to channel and harness it because the truth of the matter is over 100 people leave Sierra Tucson every month with a restored love of life and they believe that they got their miracle which is our which is our yeah. tagline expect a miracle and so it's not ethical to ask them to go and leave a positive review mm-hmm. however a number of us are very active out in the community locally nationally inter- and internationally telling our story and offering clinical expertise at no cost to other clinicians out there 
Hmm. And that has been the way that we've decided to really confront the negative media attention. We are doing so many positive things yes. that if anyone still wants to talk negatively about us, okay, but I am still inspired every day to tell our story and to continue to save more lives. So kind of the the advice for people, uh, if they're feeling frustrated, they feel that it's difficult not to take it personally to be under attack to to channel that and maybe participate more in their industry participate more in yes. raising the standard of excellence in their industry and to have more of a positive community presence i, I mean it, it it's easy to argue against silence but you don't have to fight back against the individual you can you can just participate at a higher level, I guess. That's right. And I believe it's about visibility as well. Yes. And during a time in town where we had a lot of negative press, we all got together and we agreed that weekend we were all going to be somewhere in this town, just Mm. letting people know us and to believe in who we are and the work that we do. And so I believe it's about channeling, as you said, Mm. any negativity into something positive and be inspired to be visible and to educate the public on on truth. That's a smart strategy. And Mm. I that I really get the sense that now people have something that they can do with that energy Mm -hmm. instead of just having it eat at them. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying it's easy. I mean, there were times <laughs> earlier this year. I mean, it, it was hard because we kept getting slammed with untruths. Yeah. But the hold your head up high. I don't know how many times I said that to people this winter. Hold your head up high and know we save lives. Let's go tell people. Yeah. No, smart strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm personally curious about our next topic. Um I'm interested to know what you see coming with respect to decriminalizing drug addiction. And I I bring this up because I know former addicts, um, they're my friends, they're my clients. Uh, Thankfully, they were able to get help and they've achieved lasting sobriety. And people I know, um, you know, some who have achieved that sobriety and have been my clients, these are business owners. Sure who are incredibly talented people. And because of their experience, they're also very empathetic. And that combination of their talent and their empathy, they're able to make a big difference in the lives of their employees and in our community. And to me, I always think, like, what a shame it would be had they not had that opportunity if if they had been treated as criminals instead of like the wonderful people that they are um so it frustrates me that change has been very slow to come on this issue despite an enormous amount of evidence that uh, of the economic inefficiency of incarceration the inevitability of recidivism because people are leaving jail as addicts which means they're not equipped to make different choices when they leave uh, you know, what changes do you see coming regarding how we criminalize addiction? Well, a couple different things. I believe that decriminalization and legalization are two different things. Yes. And I believe as the population is educated and begins to advocate more for decriminalization rather than legalization, I believe then we will be able to make some positive changes. Legalization is also synonymous with commercialization. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it becomes complicated. Mm. And I don't disagree with you in terms of the decriminalization and and being able to work with someone with treatment rather than incarceration. Mm. What do you think it would take to get to the point to better fund treatment options, you know, for people like do you ever see us getting to a point where instead of people going to jail, they're going to a treatment facility? Do you, are things moving in that 
direction at all? Or I feel that with the opioid crisis, yeah, as tragic as it has been, it has certainly raised awareness on addiction. Five years ago, people were not talking about substance use disorder as they are now. And I believe that right now we we know that it can happen in any home regardless. Mm-hmm. And I think five years ago, there was always this, you know, not in my home, not my kid. There's even a nonprofit by that name. Hmm. And so <clears throat> I believe that with the opioid crisis, if there has been one positive that's come out of it is that recognition that this is a societal, a societal um, problem mm-hmm. and that we get to step up and do something about it. And it affects everyone. Absolutely. Socioeconomics, it, it, it does not discriminate. It Addiction does it not. It does not. Um, that's interesting. And, you know, we have we still the number one drug of choice is still alcohol. And more yep. people die of alcohol related deaths than opioid overdoses. Yeah. And so and that's legal. Which also fuels my frustration. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and, and from strictly a, a practical point of view, I. Uh, I meet a lot of of business owners in a lot of different industries, and you know some of them are are looking for um, manage managers and supervisors, and others need really good laborers, just yeah. really good workers, and they're prepared to treat people well. They're prepared to pay them a good salary and good benefits. But they're they're kind of wondering, well, where is the labor pool? And I was just I was shocked when I when I looked up that two point three million people are incarcerated in the U.S. And the Justice Department says that fifty eight percent of state prisoners and sixty three percent of all sentenced inmates meet the criteria for drug dependence or abuse. So it's just there's an absurdity to it in my mind that a million people are at some point going to be released from jail and be given no tools and have no ability to become constructive Mm -hmm. because they haven't they have not healed from their addiction. And it's uh, it's just it's sad to me. Mm -hmm. I know the state of Arizona. <clears throat> did have the the cool program and that was the the group I told you that I did when I first got out of graduate school for people getting out of prison on drug charges. Mm-hmm. So I know that there are some things being done on the state level to provide resources and I know in prison there's 12 step groups and those kinds of things but you're absolutely right it's a very serious need in our society. Mm. Do you see um does Sierra Tucson have any kind of um, role to play in that at all? Or is that kind of outside of your mission as a, as a private care center? It's it's rather outside of our mission mm-hmm. as, as a business. However, um, you mentioned that I was... Uh, um, appointed to the elected to the board of the National Association of Addiction Treatment Providers. Mm-hmm. That's something that we are actively involved in. In last May, at our board meeting, 120 of us stayed an extra day in Washington D.C. and descended upon Capitol Hill. <sighs> and I met with five of our um, Arizona state legislators, senators, and lobbying mm-hmm. for mental health parity and all things related to addiction. So we are finding our voice and our voice is getting louder as i mentioned with the opioid with the opioid crisis yeah. suicide phenomenon yeah it's becoming more prevalent and we are getting more acknowledgement our voice is being heard and i believe the stigma is reducing yes uh, because it it affects people we know exactly it, this is not something that's just on the fringe and it and it doesn't touch our lives. Right. I think it touches a, a lot of people. So thank you for adding your voice uh, to that. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Um, uh, my last question for you is there there seems to still be kind of like this cultural badge of honor awarded for working long hours. And that nose to the grindstone ethic uh, has very deep roots. But 
there's a lot of evidence to support shifting our focus to effectiveness yep. rather than just you know hours on the job. Um, I don't know what it is now, uh, but years ago when I was going through my coaches training, the average American works 100,000 hours over the course of their lives. And so, you know, of course, there's also all of the data about the impact of stress and exhaustion on our physical and mental health. As a mental health professional, what's one thing that you would really like to see the American workforce embrace? And what could business leaders do to help make that possible? So I don't know if you saw this, but the World Health Organization just recognized burnout as a psychological syndrome. Wow. And I was delighted to see that. Yes. Because if the World Health Organization is is really speaking our language, yeah. then a lot of business leaders will not think it's all fluff and, you know, just soft skill things. Uh, right. It can be linked to lost productivity. And that's the language of a lot of business leaders. And, you know, yeah. that's OK. But I was delighted when the World Health Organization did that. And I thought, OK, now they'll listen to us. Yes. And it's so much more complicated than it was, say, 20 years ago when we were just learning about our cell phones, is that there is the expectation now that we are always on. Yes. And I remember a day where we would walk out the door and the phone, I mean, the phone was on the desk at your office. Right. And you might come into a stack of pink messages, but there was no expectation that you were always on. Mm -hmm. And so I believe at Leaders, what we can do is power down. Mm. And some of us have, a, I have responsibility for a facility, so it's not realistic that I can power down. However, I don't have the, I don't have to have the expectation that everyone on our team always has to be available. Mm. And if I choose to work a weekend as a leader, then I get to think twice before I email a team on the weekend, before I text a team member on the weekend, mm -hmm. and just ask, is it really necessary that I interrupt their weekend flow with this? Hmm. And so I believe it goes back to electronics and healthy electronics use in the workplace. That's a really good point. There are, there are times, sometimes I'm, you know, I'm trying to catch up on things on the weekend and I find myself saving a lot of draft messages because even if I put in the subject line, it's the weekend, ignore. I, I still feel like I'm interrupting them. And so I'm trying to keep things as a draft and then send everything out Monday mm -hmm. morning. And it doesn't even have to be anything that someone has to act on. I mean, maybe the action has to be on my part and they've mm -hmm. been waiting for a, for a response from me. Mm -hmm. But the fact that that ding is going to go off on a Saturday at two o'clock when they should be with you know, their family or resting or just enjoying themselves. Mm -hmm. um, it feels it feels very intrusive. That's exactly the word that I was thinking. It is intrusive. And I hold myself accountable to not do that as much as I did a month ago. Mm, that's that is a really good point. Mm -hmm. I'm making all kinds of mental notes here, Jamie. <laughs> the thing I wanted to bring up that I just learned of this yesterday from a, a former client who's he lives in Canada and he said what his company does is every five years so the way it works is that for four years you take 80 percent pay and hmm. then year five you get a year off and in that year off you're able to do whatever it is you want to do the idea is is that you'll get some additional training education do something to further your to better your um, your education, your physical well-being, something for yourself. And hmm. then you come, so you're paid 80% for that fifth year. And then you come back and decide if you want to do it again. That is a great idea. I would take that deal all day, every day. I had never heard of that before. And my Me mind either. just kept wandering about therapists, nurses, you know, people, just clinicians. How beautiful would that be? Well, especially, you know, People in those professions, I think any profession where you are holding a lot of space for for people to process things that are very stressful and very difficult. Um, and I, I mean, going back to what the World Health Organization says about burnout isn't um, 
like uh, there's caretaker fatigue yes. now as well. Mm-hmm. And I I know a lot of business owners who are in that sandwich generation where they're taking care of aging parents. They're also trying to um you know, finish raising their younger family or get their children through college or get their children started in life. And they're, they have responsibilities on both ends. And, you know, how amazing would it be to be able to take that year off and not only continue taking care of everyone else, but put a little gas back in your own tank? I mean, that's a, that's mm-hmm. a pretty phenomenal deal. Yeah. Um, boy, you gave us a lot to, think about thank you very much oh, my uh, we're gonna do the proust lightning round okay let's are you do it. ready i'm ready all right the proust questionnaire was a parlor game popularized by the french essayist and novelist marcel proust he believed that by answering 35 specific questions an individual reveals their true nature we're going to go through as many questions as we can in just three minutes okay yep all right the first is what do you consider your greatest achievement? Being a mother of three beautiful children. Oh. If you were to die and come back as a person or a thing, what would it be? I would like to come back as a person. Mm-hmm. And I would like to be... Um, I'd like to be my husband. (laughs) Why? Just because he is um, the most intelligent, articulate person I've ever met. And I would like to go through life with his gifts. That is such a great answer. Mm -hmm. And a first, I'll have you know. I don't mean that in the narcissistic way that it sounded. As soon as I said it, I thought, hmm, that didn't sound right. No, (laughs) no. That's a great answer. Um, where would you most like to live? Scottsdale, Arizona. Yeah. What is your most treasured possession? This necklace that belonged to my mom. It's very pretty. Thank you. What do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? Grief. Mm. What is your favorite occupation? Being a therapist. Mm -hmm. What is your most marked characteristic? Grit. You're a Midwesterner, sister. I don't think that's optional. (laughs) What is your greatest regret? That I didn't marry my husband earlier. That's mine, too. Mm -hmm. I know. We met later. I wish I had found him sooner. Um, What are your favorite names? Joseph. And Alexandra. And how would you like to die? Riding my horse, Firefly. Firefly. Mm -hmm. Is he a little spirited? Uh, She's a mare. And yes, she is a bit spirited. (laughs) Very cool. Um, We're going to end our interview today with Dear Coach. Uh, Jamie, I'd love to have you chime in at the end of our last segment. Dear Coach gives our listeners the chance to have their emailed questions addressed. And today's Dear Coach is about the benefits of using behavioral analysis in your business. As a coach, I've had a lot of people reach out to me because they are struggling with their sales or with leading their team. Once I dig a little deeper into what's going on, I often find that the problem is rooted firmly in miscommunication or maybe a misunderstanding of how others around them make decisions. The good news is there's a simple bang for the buck tool that you can use to head off these problems, and it is called the DISC assessment, D-I-S-C. For well over 100 years, psychologists and social scientists have studied and classified human behavior. In the late 1920s, the psychologist and inventor William Moulton Marston found himself more fascinated by the behavior of average people than he was by abnormal psychology. Based on his research, Marston found four primary characteristics that motivate the behavior of typical people. He described them as dominance, inducement, submission, and compliance. 
For a more modern take, I refer to them as director, influencer, supporter, and contemplator. Instead of intelligence, mental health, or values, the DISC assessment measures your behavioral style. The four categories of scoring reflect how you respond to challenges, how you influence others, your preferred pace, and your compliance with rules and procedures. When it comes to your business, think for a moment how powerful it would be if you led a staff meeting knowing how to appeal to every person in the room or made a presentation to a prospective client using information and language that accurately connected to what they value. Or what if you were able to anticipate your current client's needs, the types of service they really are looking for, and were then able to increase your retention and recurring revenue? These are very real examples of what you can achieve for your business when you know how to genuinely connect with others. We've all heard of the golden rule, treat others as you wish to be treated. The problem with that rule is that assume everyone shares your perspective and values. I prefer the platinum rule, which is treat others as they wish to be treated. So as an example, let's look at what happens in a sales situation when you are not conscious of how you behave in relation to the person you're presenting to. The following are four common scenarios I have repeatedly encountered, both as a consumer and a coach. See if any of these sound familiar. You speak quickly and bottom line everything, thinking that you're being respectful of the prospective client's time. In reality, they find you brusque and aggressive. You do not get the sale. You are chatty and reveal personal information about yourself, thinking that you're establishing a rapport with a prospective client. In reality, they find you self-centered and unprofessional. You do not get the sale. You are quietly reserved and keep opinions to yourself, thinking that you're not bragging or being too forceful. In reality, the prospective client is left feeling that you are not qualified or confident. You do not get the sale. And lastly, you might provide lengthy analysis and information to a prospective client, thinking that you're helping them to make an informed decision. In reality, they are overwhelmed by your details and feel unheard. You do not get the sale. So really, regardless of your business or industry, everything comes back to people. Your products, services, systems, financials, and sales are greatly influenced by your ability to communicate clearly. And that's why behavioral analysis is such a powerful business tool. You can learn how others think, what motivates their behavior, and ways to meaningfully connect with them. Apply that knowledge to your sales efforts, and it can be a huge boost to your bottom line. For step-by-step details of how to apply the DISC in your sales efforts, check out my book on Amazon. It's called DISC, Leverage Your Nature, Increase Your Sales, and the link will be in today's show notes. Uh, Jamie, we have a few minutes left. What other advice can you add for business owners and executives looking to improve their communication? I believe that I'm a big fan of the servant leader model. Mm -hmm. And when we look at our organizations with ourselves at the bottom of the pyramid rather than at the top, Mm -hmm. it gives the, I, I always do the inverted pyramid as hands and that shows how we support. And really that's what we're there for, to hold our organizations up and to support and to be able to create a safe container for people to do their best work, regardless of the profession. I love that. And on that very perfect note, we come to the end of today's episode. If you have a question or a problem you'd like for us to talk about during our Dear Coach segment, please email me at stephanie at the rising effect dot com. You can also find today's show notes on my small biz Big Voices Facebook page. My thanks again to my guest, Jamie Vink of Sierra Tucson, my producer, Mark Bishop, and to you for joining us on Small Biz Big Voices. 